Papa Day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the class lecture hall here at the University of Guam. My name is Arlene Steffi, and I am the chair of the Mark Seminar Series. I want to welcome you, especially because you're special. You are the last group. You are here to listen to our last lecturer, and that individual is Dr. Jerry San Agustin Paris. And, you know, it's really difficult for me to take him seriously because I've known him since I was a little kid. And if you know anything about this man, he's everything but. And he is a practical joker at all costs, right? And so I told him he had an hour to present, and he said, okay. He texted me about 3.30 and said, my five-minute speech is done. And I said, oh, you're funny. You have a whole hour. He goes, I'll repeat it 12 times. So brace yourself, because honestly, I don't know what he has to say. But I know that every time I speak to this individual, I have a great time. I've known him, like I said, since I was probably knee high, maybe even sooner than I knew how to speak. But every time I've sat with him, every time I asked him, Uncle Jerry, can you tell me something about this or that? He was always willing to accommodate me and always walked away from the discussions a lot more informed than when I came, and sometimes corrected on the things that I had learned. And so I consider him one of my most valuable mentors and one of my favorite uncles, yet I'm not even related to the man. And so I, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Gerald St. Augustine Paris. Thanks, Arlene. So this is the last speaker in this last series, so obviously she's scraping the bottom of the barrel just to finish the year up. Um, before I went up here, she said, hey, do you need to go to the bathroom? I said, no, I'll just make them up handy in the side in case you see a puddle. Man, what does it take for these guys to laugh? I got something to make you laugh. My friend, Dr. Ancito Walters here, and another friend that I would like to share Joe Arnett from the chamber. Uh, and I were in a retirement home. This is some years into the future. So the three of us were sitting down comparing notes. And, uh, and Sito gets up first and he says, you know, guys, I have trouble in the morning. At 6 o'clock, it takes me half an hour to pee and another half an hour to take a crap. I says to him, I says, oh, you know, I have a similar problem. I wake up at six and it takes me 10 minutes to pee and another half an hour to take a prep. My friend Jordan says, oh, you guys, I have no problem. At six o'clock precisely, I take a pee and two minutes later, a healthy crap. So he says, so what's the problem? I said, my problem is I don't wake up until 12. <laughs> there, there's some chuckle. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for this evening. I have an opportunity to talk about a topic that we've kind of all talked about in, in the business community, but never really uh, dug deeply into it. And most of the time, discussions I have with my friends in the business community and elsewhere, it's pretty superficial. So I thought I'd do something a little bit different and really dig into it a little bit more and try to put a little bit of... Uh, heft in some of the issues that uh, come up when people talk about political status for Guam. So as the topic shows, Guam's political status, what price the myth of independence? You know, power without principle is bankrupt, but principle without power is futile. These are the words of Great Britain's Prime Minister Tony Blair at the time of his inauguration. He acknowledges that his, in his political party that his party is a party of government and that he will lead it as a party of government. A government that asserts political independence but does so in an increasingly bigger world of interdependencies. Interdependencies politically, socioeconomically, and militarily. So, how exactly does this relate to Guam? And what is the body politic that would assert political independence as an option to pursue in this world of interdependencies? 
interdependencies among nation states. The notion of political independence, I would argue, is a myth in the context just described, but it is one that has lingered in Guam for half a century, fueled by those who either subscribe to the philosophical purity of its meaning, or who represent a group, a coalition of diverse single-issue advocates driven more by their fidelity to an emotional issue than to the pursuit of, quote, unsatisfied ambitious ambitions. In the words of a local student who uttered these phrases 40 years ago while attending Brown University. Increasingly, this growing coalition is younger, more militant, and proficient in the use of social media. But several times removed from the genesis of its origin. Several, several times removed from the genesis of its origin, the paradigm shifts in the island's development and the divergence of resident attitudes that have impacted, that have been impacted by an evolving climate of change. In my view, the oxygen that has sustained this issue for several generations has been the self-aggrandizing political class of all persuasions and the coalition of self-serving interest groups, not to be disparaged, but to be seen as part of the reason for the issue's persistence. Political independence, my layman's understanding of political independence refers to governments that are sovereign or states recognized as having the right to freely exercise the full range of power in their position under international law. In short, states, countries that have the ability to make their own decisions about their own domestic and foreign policies. By this definition, embedded in the 1933 Montevideo Convention in Uruguay, Guam is clearly not independent. The Montevideo <coughs> Convention established the standard definition of an independent state or country to be equal sovereigns if they have a permanent population defined territorial boundaries, a functioning government, and the ability to enter into agreements with other states. Signatories of the convention also agreed not to intervene in the domestic or foreign affairs of another state. Territorial gains made by force will not be recognized, and all disputes are to be settled peacefully. Consistent with the Montevideo Accord, more recent policies of the United Nations acknowledge and recognize the principle of a people's identity and right to decide their own fate. This then, according to advocates of this principle, increases self-value, esteem, and the basis for the promised fruits and benefits of independence. But at what price? Independence from whom exactly? independence from whom given Guam's fusion to an ever widening and deepening relationship with exogenous forces, economic, social, cultural, and political. At best, we have very limited control over these external forces and the political realities they sow. To believe otherwise, I would argue, is to embrace futility by asserting the principle without power model that I just alluded to earlier. Whether large country or small, political independence is an elastic concept defined by outcomes of individually negotiated external forces, political and natural, done peacefully or otherwise. This is the lens through which I share my views this evening and the basis for my personal conviction in this never-ending debate of Guam's political status. And so the myth of political independence, as I understand its advocacy, is exactly that, a myth, or the false notion and misbelief that the outcome of political independence as an end state in our political evolution would somehow be decolonizing, decolonizing from our historic past and current relationship with the United States. And while it is possible for us to achieve the political status of our choosing, the realities of an emerging world order will define who we are politically. 
whether we choose independence, statehood, or free association, our status, quote unquote, will be defined materially by what we are able to negotiate within the framework of an increasingly multipolar world order. And while status, excuse me, and while status quo is not viewed as an option, I would argue its merits and the negotiated enhancement that we could extract to strengthen local autonomy, redefine mutual obligations, and otherwise maximize our potential for self-sufficiency in closer union with the United States. Recent debate over Guam's political status specifies independence as one of three options to consider. I will not address the other two options, but will focus my remarks on political independence, my assigned topic this evening. In full disclosure, I will tell you that I am not a political scientist, nor am I an expert on the finer points of political status and the parsing of language to describe its various forms. I leave that to academics, academics who enjoy the luxury of free thinking, but not necessarily the consequence of its reality. My remarks are a reflection of my upbringing, having been born during the Japanese occupation. Yes, I'm that old. <laughs> I got carried in the arms of my parents during the Manangan March of 1944 and educated on the island within the legacy of American colonialism, as some would put it. So my views come from the prism of an historical period lived and the ever-evolving realities that have influenced my personal upbringing and that have shaped the island's political development. Embedded within me is the childhood that I was blessed to have experienced right after the war. Still fresh in my mind were the Hershey chocolate bars and Wrigley's chewing gum that I was consuming as a five-year-old riding around in an army jeep. I also remember climbing in and out of jeeps, trucks, tanks, and other stockpiles of armament in a secure depot where guards allowed me and my friends to play, pretending not to see us, but then after a while, chase us away after we have had our fun. And yes, I was punished for speaking Chamorro in class. I still remember that darn Maggie Duenas in third grade who reported me to the teacher to this day. <clears throat> but I also remember very well the milestones that have marked the island's economic growth, social and political development going back three quarters of a century. My generation was a part of these milestones. And I had the good fortune to have been an active participant in government, private business, and various civic, fraternal, and nonprofit organizations where many of these milestones and achievements were incubated, hatched, and implemented. During this time, we confronted and overcame impediments, impediments of our own making or the result of adverse federal policy. We were also always mindful of the unfairness that burdened us frequently with respect to our federal relationship, but we were never, never ever debilitated from working around barriers, exploiting opportunity, and collaborating with the federal government to achieve a unified goal. It was this unanimity of purpose and a unified goal in our community message that have enabled us to achieve much of the increasing political autonomy that we have come to enjoy today. It is also this unanimity of a message that has enabled us to generate a good framework for development economically, socially, and yes, politically. Not since the non-voting delegate law was passed in April 1972 have I really seen a united front in the community for us to share an objective? Today, however, we can't seem to agree even on war reparation payments, even when we all agree that they ought to be paid right away. Petty politics has been our biggest single obstacle in getting things done and in resolving the question of political status. And we want political independence, a status implicit within which are the attributes of 
financial responsibility, political maturity, and competence in the delivery of our most basic of public services. How are all these working for us? But I digress. I am also mindful of indigeneity and its significance in the resurgence of ethnocentric movements around the world. My own studies have sensitized me to indigenous culture and to the challenges confronted today by 370 million people in more than 90 countries who make up 5% of the world's population, but 15% of the most poor. <clears throat> so my remarks today have taken this aspect into account, albeit with this underpinning of reality. Reality and its manifestation in all forms political, social, cultural, and economic. Public debate on independence has focused on the singular theme of letting indigenous residents decide the island's political status. At the root of this theme is its importance for a country because a state or nation would not exist or possess a distinct identity without being, quote, independent, end quote. The problem, I would argue, is the way that this distinct identity is to be determined by a voting pool of, quote, qualified voters chosen arbitrarily by historical calendar, absent indigenous purity. Another problem is associating the debate on independent political status with abject poverty, a point of view that I believe ill serves deeper discourse on the merits and discredits the people of Guam and our ability to become more than a welfare state. The $314 million Guam receives annually is about one third of the government budget and clearly not insignificant. But to dismiss it outright and imply that we are not able to produce income of this magnitude shortchanges serious debate. Yet another issue is the practical problem of harmonizing the diverse aspirations among several generations deeply rooted to 120 years of American acculturation and the monolithic beam off it has produced culturally, socially, and institutionally. The right to self-determination and the process by which people establish or charter their own statehood and allegiances is a cardinal principle. This principle is widely accepted under international law and authoritative interpretation of its norms embodied in the United Nations Charter on Equal Rights and Self-Determination of Peoples. In principle, the idea of political independence for Guam is not as far-fetched, nor is it as dismissive as many would believe. Indeed, there are tangible and intangible assets that could be harnessed to address such concerns as economic self-sufficiency, security, and lifestyles, much the same way that other independent island states currently enjoy. The Bahamas, Cayman Islands, Barbados, and Grenada in the Caribbean come to mind. Jersey and other sovereign island states in the North Atlantic come to mind as well. In the taxonomy of island economies, an independent Guam would fall in one of two possible species, namely the Mirab or profit site models described in the literature. Mirab or M-I-R-A-B is an acronym for migration, remittances, foreign aid, and public bureaucracy. Profit stands for people considerations, resource management, overseas engagement, finance, insurance, and taxation, and transportation. Sites mean small island tourist economies. Regionally, for example, the FSM can be characterized as belonging to the Mirab model, the Republic of Palau to sites, and Guam to the profit side economic model. Mirab economies rely heavily on emigrant remittances and foreign aid. As in the case of islands in the North Atlantic, where there is elasticity 
in negotiated sovereign political and legal relationships, Guam's profit side model has facilitated the strategic use of judicial autonomy to act to achieve locally centered benefits. An example of this negotiated asset is the visa waiver program that triggered the island's multi-million dollar tourism industry we enjoy today. Another example is the country code that integrated Guam more than 5,000 miles away into the U.S. North American dialing system, which made telephone calls to the U.S. mainland, quote, domestic in nature. This negotiated benefit has resulted in enormous savings to local residents than was the case previously when the island was still considered an international telephone destination. A dynamic private sector tourism export income and strategic orientation toward diversification in financial services can broaden foundations for Guam's economic self-sufficiency. It can also broaden foundations for Guam's economic self-sufficiency independent of the U.S. military footprint and other subsidies. An active domestic agenda on creative tax, insurance, shipping, and corporate registries, in addition to the extraction of resources within our economic zone, provide ample potential for economic self-sufficiency. A common refrain in status negotiations is the island's lack of natural resources. But not having an immense domestic endowment, however, does not necessarily preempt the development of small, post-colonial, insular economies following emancipation. Historical observations in the literature suggest that the availability or absence of an immense domestic natural endowment is an inert factor in determining economic growth and development strategy. A rentier economy can be an option based on strategic location, tax differentials, fishing rights, maritime flags of convenience, and tourism supply. In essence, foreign exchange earnings from a rentier economy can address much of the concerns on self-sufficiency. This rentier income is essentially driven by the productive value in the island's hinterlands. And it is this interaction of, or fusion to the external world order that materially renders to independent status, the myth or false notion of independence. The European age of discovery in the 1400s to 1600s has forever changed the landscape and true meaning of political independence as defined in today's lexicon. Perhaps nowhere is this best illustrated than in the island colonies of France and the Indian Ocean, where assimilation within the metropolitan regime is near complete. In spite of limited French administrative presence in the Indian Ocean, for example, its cultural hegemony has persisted. Closer to home, the European and American vestiges of colonial occupation linger, political emancipation notwithstanding, in the Federated States of Micronesia and the Republics of Palau and the Marshall Islands. Embedded at the core of Guam's indigenous assets are opportunities that can exploit a rentier economic structure based on our proximity to a geographically diverse region of, 60, of 36 countries, more than half the world's population, and the global strategic interests of hegemons in the West and East, currently U.S. and the People's Republic of China. Who knows what the next millennium will bring and which hegemons will assert dominance in the future economic environment, new technology infrastructure, and shifting security alliances. But the negotiable assets for an independent state remain in place because of the island's fixed location and a legal framework of Western orientation, that is, assuming it's not scuttled. Political independence and island security. While there is merit in pursuing political independence, at least from the prism of economic self-sufficiency, the realities of an emerging geopolitical order inherently puts the island at risk if political independence were to be granted. 
The island's location today provides a unique security benefit at this time, a benefit that is associated with competing regional states, competing regional states of military strategy, technology, and economic alliances. Political independence will mean the assertion of an identity that abandons our U.S. passport, along with all the benefits and international protections it affords. The notion of joining the world community as a sovereign state might be appealing to advocates for independence, but its corollary of being an equal entity, quote unquote, in the world stage is simply a hollow expectation of material insignificance. What is the value of living in a country that safeguards a vibrant political system with robust freedoms of expression, religious beliefs, civil liberties, and due process? According to a survey by Fine Law, 32% of Americans feel that freedom of speech is its most important right afforded by the U.S. Constitution. This is followed by 24% who cited due process and 21% the exercise of religious and voting rights. In my view, these benefits are immeasurable value and they defy economic estimates, but are likely shared, I suspect, by many people in Guam. What's the worth of being an American citizen and holding a U.S. passport? How would you value the cost and benefit of not having it? U.S. citizens can leave the country for as long as they want and return freely anytime. Being able to travel freely in a big, is a big benefit with special rights and protections when traveling outside the U.S. There is no visa requirements for U.S. passport holders in many, many countries and just minimal requirements for many others. In world travel, the passport of a country with more than 300 million people is more likely to have reciprocal entries to more countries than an independent country like Guam with a much smaller population. Moreover, one of the highest State Department priorities is protecting U.S. citizens around the world and providing assistance, including repatriation arrangements, when necessary. How much is this worth? An independent Guam exposes the island to unscrupulous hegemons far and near. Unless negotiated, hence the independent myth, the U.S. will have no affirmative obligation to include Guam within its security perimeter. In the next millennium, it is not far-fetched to envision the island's geographic and strategic obsolescence, given emerging paradigms in warfare, tech, warfare strategy, tactics, and technology. Kinetic and non-kinetic territorial annexations in Eastern Europe the South China Sea and elsewhere by unchallenged metropolitan powers are lessons not to be ignored. Political independence in the climate of emerging technologies and warfare, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things can, can marginalize Guam as a rentier economy because of the irrelevance to which the island would be relegated by competing hegemons in the world order. We're witnessing today the shift from an east-west bipolar Cold War orientation of competing world powers to an increasingly multipolar geopolitical mix of different countries aligned militarily, economically, and religiously. Vast impersonal forces are redefining world economics, technology, and politics and are fundamentally altering relationships among the community of nations. The information revolution has also heightened conflicts between and among superpowered nation states with redistribution of global power, the resulting consequence. Thus, in a few decades, the primacy of American power had given way to the unpredictable multipolarity and, quote, faceless beasts wreaking havoc today, end quote. In the words of scholars from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown and the American Enterprise Institute. 
The impact to Guam from the external interaction of global hegemons is not to be taken lightly. Throughout human history, much has changed in the ascent and in the demise of political powers. The great British Empire was arguably the largest in human history, having once ruled more than 23% of the world population and more than 24% of the globe before collapsing after the Second World War. Prior to that, there were many other empires, dynasties, and caliphates that extended their sovereignty and which lasted for various durations. The 500-year Roman Empire, Mughals in Northeast Asia, Middle East caliphates, France, Spain, Portugal, and the Netherlands in Europe, and China's Yuan and Qing dynasties are among many others in human history too numerous to mention. Even Greece, the cradle of Western civilization, did not survive the external force of the Roman Empire. I mentioned the rise and fall of these world powers to acknowledge secular oscillations in the ascendancy, preeminence, and duration of world powers, past, present, and possibly the future. The age of European discovery and successive maritime dominance of Great Britain, France, Spain, the Netherlands, and Germany over the course of three centuries in Micronesia and in Asia provide ample testimony that in the next millennium, the only thing that will not change is change itself. At best, the uncertainty of which power an independent Guam will confront in the next millennium remains unknown. But while this issue is important to our economy and our society, it pales in comparison to the risk of subjugation to a power incongruous to our values and institutions. Central to the issue of self-determination is the indigenous yearning for recognition at our place in the universe and the sovereign power to discharge domestic and international affairs without encumbrances to colonial ties. In this era of increasing multipolarity, however, and especially in our region, where China is asserting its primacy with little or no consequence to its widening, indeed even deepening, sphere of economic, military, and territorial influence, the idea of an independent and sovereign Guam is an important security concern to me. Respect for territorial integrity, as defined by the United Nations Charter, is frequently breached with little or no consequences, as in the case of the Ukraine, Georgia, the Balkans in Europe, the islands of the South China Sea in Asia, and the disputed borders of Nepal and Kashmir and other places. The remapping and establishment of countries in the Middle East, in Europe, and the former territories of the Ottoman Empire's 1918 collapse all bear witness to the fluid nature of world powers and territorial domination just in the last century, the last 200 years even. More recently, a resurgent China's claim and militarization of islands in the South China Sea continues unabated despite protests to international authorities affected countries much larger than Guam. I'm talking about Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Taiwan. In this situation, therefore, raw power becomes a function of territorial sovereignty. So it matters not that an independent Guam can assert sovereignty when more powerful forces can overwhelm our right, quote unquote, and therefore our ability to exercise it. It would be like me walking across the street in a crosswalk and not stopping for a car speeding in my direction. I have the right to keep walking and I have the right of way and I will still be right. I would be dead right. So I hearken to my earlier comment about having principle, but with powerless futility. Large 
countries neighboring the South China Sea are discomforted by the expanding hegemony of China and perceived waning of American influence in Asia. This regional concern ought to be that of Guam as well, because not being tethered to the only country capable of counterbalancing China is a risk too much for us to ignore. Philosophically, there is an optimistic point of view of relevance to the debate on self-determination and the rationalization for independent status. This view suggests that forces driving the fulfillment of economic aspiration and struggle for rec recognition, even among disparate societies, eventually converge to cause the collapse of tyrannies and thereby produce self-fulfillment of identity and socioeconomic harmony. This thesis posits that the end to Cold War conflicts and collapse of the Soviet Union is paving the way toward establishing capitalist liberal democracies within their spatial and temporal dimensions. In this context, the issue is whether man's political and economic liberty and equality can result in producing a stable and satisfactory society or if deprived the outlets to absorb struggles for mastery, plunge the world back into the chaos and bloodshed of history. My own practical view is that these theses, while intellectually compelling in logic and historic illustration, is betrayed by the unpredictability of human behavior, the inherent conflicts sure to arise from emerging forms of socioeconomic stability and the heightened multipolarity of the post-Cold War hegemons. It is this latter concern and its security implication that distances me from the advocacy of independent status. To me, economic sustainability within the framework of Guam's unique culture and heritage is not in itself an inconceivable concept. To the contrary, we have already in place many of the elements that can propel the island's economy under an intensified profit site model that I described earlier. But absent our security tethered to power, we would be woefully hapless to confront any external force at our peril. To me, the issue of destination security trumps all because it is the protective shield that enables us to function in a free society and to engage in the endeavors of our choosing, no matter the political status. Security arrangements, even between long-standing allies, can be an ephemeral relationship. It can be an ephemeral relationship in the global arena of competing world powers. The centuries-old US and Australian alliance is a good example of this transiency, especially with respect to national defense and nuclear proliferation. An increasingly bellicose China and Australian views of President Trump's capricious temperament and perceived unreliability have rekindled debate on Australia's need to develop its own nuclear deterrent. Defense analysts have historically believed that the country would not be targeted even in a serious nuclear conflagration between the US and Soviet Union. In the current environment, however, China is much more likely a kinetic adversary because of its aggressive territorial encroachment in the South China Sea and South Pacific, two geopolitical hotspots within Australia's sphere of influence. Australia had relied on a bankable U.S. security guarantee while mineral exports to China assured a recession-proof economy. But the perception of Trump's limited regard for alliances and Xi Jinping's quest for primacy in the Pacific have put Australia's defense and economic security in doubt. The country is now very much in the front line, according to Malcolm Davis, an Australian military planner calling for a rethinking of the country's defense. And Hugh White, 
a former advisor to prime ministers and the doyen among Canberra military analysts, believes that it is time to get off the fence and do something more decisive about their country's strategic autonomy. A professor of strategic studies of the Australian National University, White cites, quote, big strategic shifts in Asia, end quote, and that it is no longer clear that nuclear weapons would never make sense to Australia's defensive deterrent. He believes that the strategic cost of foregoing nuclear weapons in the new Asian environment could be much greater than they have been to date. I cite this Australian example to illustrate the huge costs of maintaining the security of political independence and the myth, perhaps risk, of political autonomy in the multipolarity of a new world order. So the notion of political independence in a multipolar world, even among very large countries, is no less mythical. In the Cold War era, barely 40 years ago, the Soviet Union had an empire stretching from its European shores to Havana in the Caribbean and Hanoi in Asia. The $16 billion in annual funding gap between hard currency receipts and the cost of maintaining this sphere of political autonomy was financed by, get this, Western governments and banks, the very constituents operate in their polar orbit. So much, so much for the concept of, quote, political independence. In a world where technology, modern transportation, and the Internet of Things have become functions of or determinants for a secure and autonomous community, the concept of political independence can be fungible. Arguably, political independence in the new world order is an elastic commodity to be bartered. The notion of an independent state is therefore defied by the granularity of negotiated outcomes extracted from the multipolar community of nations. When viewed through this lens, perhaps only those living in, in indigenous sovereignty and who have not been impacted by external contact can truly lay claim to political independence. Geographic isolation in the dense jungles of New Guinea Southeast Asia, the Amazon forests, and island archipelagos of the Andaman Sea has enforced this sovereignty. It has enforced this sovereignty in a manner unmatched by forces around the world. And the protective nature of some, as in the case of the North Sentinel Islands of the Andaman Coast, for instance, the Sentinelese are very, very protective and aggressive in maintaining their independence and just attack just about anyone who comes ashore. I do not believe that political independence debilitates Guam from economic prosperity because sustaining the demands of a much smaller population of perhaps fewer than 30 to 40,000 should be an easier threshold to support following the exodus of those choosing to keep their US passports and citizenship. This crude population estimate of mine is of an independent Guam was not derived empirically. Rather, it is my own guess after years of discussing this status with friends, relatives, business associates on Guam and elsewhere, and barely finding, barely finding one in 10 who would even consider the option seriously. This estimate is also consistent with the results of a survey done by a guest columnist of the Pacific Daily News done earlier this year. When 22% of residents sampled favored an independent political status. Of those surveyed, 24% favored statehood and a whopping 54% preferred the status quo. Based on the Leon Guerrero survey and Guam population of 159,000 based on the 2010 census, 35,000 of the people on the island might be inclined to stay, which is an estimate consistent with my guess. 
generations of acculturation into the tapestry and American ethos that adhere to the principle of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, while quaint, is nonetheless foundational to the idea of a closer union with the U.S. I am not wedded to the status quo as we know it today, but to a self-determined and negotiated covenant unifying us closer to, but not necessarily quite in full union with, the 50 states. A covenant that is unique in character, specific to our situation, and incorporated into the body politic of American orthodoxy, but one that gives dual sovereignty, as in the several states, and the ability to achieve greater social and economic autonomy. Who is to say that the historical path and conditions toward closer union with the U.S. is exclusively statehood? The next millennium is likely to produce radically different paradigms in technology, human aspirations, medicine, transportation, and international alliances. In this context, who can predict our place in the universe? Who can envision and describe how it will be? And who is to say what institutional structures can best serve our community in the next millennium? These are wide open questions that beg, that beg deep and innovative temporal exploration. The question is, are we up to the task? Thank you. Tall tales. Very tall tales. Uh, you mentioned that at the end of your rather Curtis presentation Curtis. that you would envision a covenant between the, the United States, between the national government and the island of Guam that had certain elements. Do you think that's possible given the fact that the Article 4, Section 3 of the United States Constitution provides almost plenary power to the Congress to make needful rules and regulations for the territories. That question is uh, a good one, Bob, and that was why I said that um, uh, it's not going to be an easy way to negotiate anything. The biggest problem we have is really not having a unified point of view. I really believe, as we have achieved in the past, a lot of the changes that have been made in the organic tag that gave us a lot more stuff than we used to have, that if we had our you-know-what together, that we can uh, develop a persuasive argument that might not be an overnight kind of an achievement, but over time uh, might migrate to something better than what it is today because the body politic changes in the states. And I know that right now it's a very, very divided, polarized uh, constituency. Um, and that can get in the way. Um, and despite the constitutional provision that you uh, alluded to, I still believe that over time, with the right conditions and a unified uh, message from Guam, there might be advocates uh, for that. Keep in mind, too, that, um, you know, the world has changed. And so, for example, the, the traditional model, the traditional path to statehood um, is very different in those days. They didn't have the internet, they didn't have transportation, technology, and stuff that we have. So um, I'm not that creative. But I got to believe that there is something in this mix of new technologies and uh, artificial intelligence and a new um, socioeconomic environment that can materially bring us closer, maybe not as a state, but something perhaps much better than we have. Uh, again, all subordinate to congressional action. Um. I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, and I concur with uh, your idea that it's, excuse me, our power to persuade 
that will get us to a, def to a destination that we can all agree with. And as I understand what you're saying is that you think that there is room within the American system to keep what we have and improve on our situation as a part of the American system. And in that respect, you are in very good company because you're in about 100% agreement with the host of tall tales. <laughs> tall tales. You know, I meant to tell you, there's another program that they're putting together right after you, after your tall tales. I'll be on. It'd be short takes. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, the importance of Guam for the United States, and we know that the United States keeps the trade route open or market from Guam. Guam is critically important to the economy of the United States. That's a 65% of all petroleum that are shipped goes through the Malacca Strait. Any terrorism that would save those super tankers would be very costly to the allies or the trading partners of the United States. Also, I understand that 60% of all materials, uh, production goods, goes through the Malacca Strait. So Malacca Strait is far, far more important than we hear about Panama Canal all the time. Now, the question is, if the United States just really it would declare our independence, or have our independence, could it be a win-win type situation? Because right now, they're just utilizing our properties. They, they do things, they bulldoze our, our uh, artifacts, and they, you know, opening up a firing range, for example, to the exception of some of us. And if we're independent, there'll be more negotiation. Uh, they will listen more to us because Guam, economically, we have these cables that are underwater that connects Guam well with Japan, with Hong Kong, with uh, Australia, and and other countries. So at and were very critically important for them too. And also military communication, uh, it's there. So I would not discount the value of one to the United States. It, it is the, the United States critically needs one for its economic, not only defensive purposes, but it, its economic trade. If there's any Mayhem that would happen here in, around the Malacca Strait, uh, it really would ruin the economy of the United States. Because if Japan cannot produce a complete Toyota, and they ship like 10 million Toyotas to the United States, can you imagine how many millions of Americans will be unemployed because they don't have that trade goods? And then Boeing 47, I mean, Boeing cannot be selling to, to airlines airplanes to Japan and it's regular trade back and forth. Uh, I, I just really feel that getting our independence is our utmost important, but also sitting down and negotiating uh, a win-win type approach. Because I know that the United States, for economic purposes and for military purposes, will not abandon Guam. That's a very valid uh, point of view, very valid concern. What I was trying to raise in my discussion is that today, in today's world paradigm, we have all these things that puts us as a valuable strategic location for the United States and other places. But I have no idea what the next 100 years would bring in terms of changes in the world order and changes in the technological environment that may render us obsolete as a location because maybe they don't need a location anymore because there's different ways of achieving what they're doing now 
through other means. I don't know what that is. I'm just posing the question uh, about that. Uh, but what you say is not, you know, uh, it's not untrue. Uh, it's very much at today's uh, date very important. Uh, you allude to the idea that while Guam can be economically stable enough to be independent, that um, political power is what keeps us from being able to move forward with that idea. Um, and then you also talked about China um, and them finding their power through economics. Um, so can we do something similar? Um, in other words, from your history and experience within uh, Guam's commercial industries, um, do we currently have any sort of economic base or, do, or are we primed for certain industries that can actually help us to build an economic power? Okay, I get you. I guess the fundamental premise that I was raising was that there are other um, sovereign island models in the North Atlantic, in the Caribbean, that are independent and that have a viable economy. Um, but we can do the same thing for Guam. But I believe that the risk of uh, the security issue is the one that I think trumps that viability because we could have a viable economy, uh, but if, we don't if we're not tethered to the security umbrella of the United States or some power like that, then we're so vulnerable, and no matter what we do to develop our economy, um, would be at risk. That was basically the, my, my premise. I appreciate your, your presentation. So um, one thing when you were talking about, because I'm familiar with a lot of the scholarship on sort of uh, the, the changing world and sort of uh, that national independence and sovereignty doesn't sort of have the same currency that it used to in terms of how the world is shifting. But I couldn't help but notice though that when you were talking like that though, and when I've read those articles, it reminds me of uh, when, when my kids were growing up and they would notice that I would use money for everything, to, to buy food, to buy things for them. And then my kids would say, oh, can I take that? And then in order to tell, in order to keep from giving them the money, I would say, oh no, you don't want money. Money is so complicated. Money isn't really worth what you think it is because you gotta work for money and then you gotta pay bills. And so in order to kind of prevent them from seeking money, in, in, in order to prevent them, or prevent, or to keep me from having to give it to them in that moment, I would sort of tell a story about how, you know, money isn't as important as it seems, or it's not as valuable as it seems. And so in your presentation, I was reminded of that idea because the, the idea that national sovereignty or independence isn't as val valuable as it used to be is oftentimes deployed to talk to those who are seeking it, seeking it to join sort of the family of nations, to join sort of the, sort of the, the minimum level of recognition that sort of states have in the world. And so um, I was definitely struck by that. And so I wanted you to kind of respond to that because even if we were to sort of look, even in many of the examples that you gave, um, having sort of a, a higher level of sovereignty would definitely put Guam in a better position to negotiate a number of the changes that you're discussing. Because for example, one thing that we have uh, benefited from is that we were attached to the United States as a territory for, for decades, and that sort of the, the ambitions and the goals in this region from, from the United States aligned with some of what Guam wanted as well. But as you talk about in the future though, what if, and there's already signs that the interests of the United States will diverge, that they will veer very sharply in another direction. We don't know if sort of what Trump is starting now will continue, but it shows definitely a lot of less emphasis on multilateral sort of agreements, on sort of working together, um, on sort of uh, the openness of the United States. There's, there's definitely a lot of potential for contraction. And so one of the reasons why you want that higher level of sovereignty is because it will allow you to negotiate that. Because without that, you are simply dragged in whatever direction the United States moves. And if the United States is friends with them, enemies with them, 
you have the friends that they have. If the United States is moving in this direction economically, you move in that direction. And so I think that for, um, for the previous generation, because the United States was, was placed so high in their minds, especially when you shared your World War II experience and, and those of that generation, sort of whichever way the United States went, it must be good for Guam. But as we, as you also mentioned, as we become more knowledgeable about the world, as we've sort of developed local industries, we, we, we gain this understanding that there might be times where the interests of Guam will diverge. And so I would like to hear sort of your thoughts on that, on that idea that even if national sovereignty or independence perhaps isn't, well, I mean, I don't know if it ever really was what they say it's supposed to be, but um, wouldn't you agree though that it would put Guam in a better position to deal with some of those issues in terms of being on a completely different part of the world, surrounded by, by other interests? Um, anyway, Sid Zuzman. Sure. Uh, my answer is yes and no. Now let me explain that. Yes in the sense that in today's negotiating framework, the currency for negotiation puts us in a geopolitical advantage. All I'm saying is that I don't know, millennium from now, whether the same buck, uh, whether the same bundle of currency items that are to be bartered will be the same. Uh, the example that I gave earlier was that um, we are strategically located, and that was uh, that has value. But there could be changes in the world that would render us obsolete as a strategic location. I mean, for example, years ago, you know, they, you make telephone calls. Now, um, the signal bounces like 20,000 miles up in the air and then down. So basically, it's instant. It doesn't take forever to get there. All I'm saying is that I think the locational advantage that we enjoy today is good. And under today's currency of negotiation, uh, your point is valid. All I'm challenging is that this may not be the same 100 years from now, and so we ought to be mindful about that. And also to your point about uh, the money and the kids, um, that's a lifestyle choice. I think that is probably, um, you know, uh, that varies with different people. And some people are more uh, satisfied with uh, lesser material goods, some with more. And uh, so, it, it, you know, I mean, there's room for, for every persuasion. Point though about changing dynamics. So that's why, in a sense, having that ability to, to, uh, to right the ship of Guam in a different direction based on those changing dynamics around you would only come with a, with a higher level of sovereignty. Is that if you were still a territory, then you would still be stuck based on sort of whatever those, so that's why, for example. Yes, I um, understand, I understand. What no, so that's why, for example, if location didn't matter as much, yeah, yeah, then what we might find is that then we would find that US interest in Guam would, would decrease. Mm -hmm. That sort of the level of engagement that we receive now, which is higher than, let's say, American Samoa, which is far less strategically important to the United States. What if Guam, because it was not as strategically important, started to get the same level of support as American Samoa? Which is, which is far less. And we wouldn't have the ability to then say, well, the US isn't giving us as much as we used to get, but we don't have the ability to ask anybody else for help because we're stuck attached to the United States. We don't have that ability to make new friends. Well, but that presumes that we are not able under you know, that scenario to develop a more vibrant economy. Uh, and I, I contend that we are. In fact, I don't know whether uh, you remember me saying earlier, but um, we do have a lot of the raw ingredients to um, be financially self-sustaining. If we had local discipline and how to spend the money uh, from our policymakers, number one. And number two, if we really generate the kind of industries that are, I mean, it's, it, it's not rocket science, a lot of, uh, uh, Sovereigns in the North Atlantic Islands and the Caribbean uh, are able to do that. It's just the political dimension in regard to security that is my concern. 
uh, and we could develop an economy and do whatever we want to do, but uh, I still, be, in my own personal opinion, I still believe that security trumps everything. Um, and, and that's what just need to be mindful in my mind. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I just, since we brought up security and security trumps everything, um, I was curious how you might respond to the comment that um, Guam's less secure because of the American military presence. So, you know, thinking that this place was, you know, invaded during World War II because of the American presence, or North Korea threatens a missile strike here because of the American military presence. You know, like I'm just kind of struck by this kind of what it feels to me like a contradiction that, you know, this place does have a target drawn on it because of, you know, this long term American military presence. So, I'm just wondering how you would respond to that. Thanks. I know that uh, there's a point of view that says that we are a target because of military assets here. But my own personal view is that I believe I feel more, much safer uh, with them here because um, the number one, number one priority for the military and the Defense Department is force protection. So we have actually the benefit of force protection as extended by you know uh, the military presence, so rather than I know what you're saying, rather than being vulnerable, we are a target. Okay, we we're also going to be a target, but I just reiterate that one of the number one priorities of the military and the defense that, that I understand is force protection, and to the extent that we have those forces from Guam, I feel honestly pretty safe. But that's my own personal personal view. I think it might be more of a comment than a question. Um, and it's a little bit of everything with what was mentioned up here, about security and the presence of the military. Um, I think with the military presence here, as you mentioned, and then with what you mentioned about being a target, I know that previously, you know, the United States, for some people felt that, you know, we were abandoned on the onset of World War II because they just up and left and it made us, you know, so open to being, um, you know, overtaken by the Japanese, right? But we also have a much larger military presence today than then, with more assets on the island than then. So I would almost say, if you were speaking on security, that the interest of the United States with their assets and personnel that are on this island, they would be not so quick to vacate, to leave, and then leave the, the local residents with nothing to defend themselves. Also, everyone here is a U.S. citizen, which they have to protect U.S. citizens, right? So I think that's a very valid point that you're making about security trumping everything else and uh, tethering to a power that has the ability to protect and security. And then when we talk about the higher level of uh, sovereignty and negotiation, that would be great in a perfect world where everyone is friendly. But unfortunately, the world is inhabited by powers and groups of people who don't abide by international laws, <coughs> laws of war, uh, armed conflict, and those kind of things. And so even though you may be a sovereign nation and be able to negotiate, if they're not willing to play fairly, your power to negotiate is no avoid. You have no power. They are just going to come in because you are defenseless, because you have no military to protect you. You have no security. So go back to security trumps everything because security is important. You can have all those things, independence, negotiating power, but without security, you're going to be overtaken by those who do not abide by international laws and communities and who don't care if they come over and just take you over, which has happened many times in our history and will happen again in the future because history always repeats itself. And we do have a strategic location that makes us enticing. Yeah, that was the point. I was giving some examples uh, historically over several hundred years how the ascension of power and the demise of power all within, I mean, it's just, uh, it's amazing. I, when I, 
when I started kind of thinking about this thing, I was only thinking like two or three world powers, but as I kind of read up on it, I'm thinking, whoa, there's a lot out there that uh, have existed. Anyway, yeah, I agree. Oh, I would, if, if I could just respond to your point. When I said a higher level of sovereignty, I wasn't only speaking about independence. I would include statehood with that because achieving state sovereignty would be higher than remaining a territory. And if you actually wanted to feel really safe with U.S. bases, then you should probably become a full part of the United States because territories throughout history are, are sacrificed. That's the purpose of the territory, is it exists as a buffer. It exists to have use, value extracted from it. It is not incorporated into the whole. It is not a part of the union. And even the history and the U.S.'s own positions have shown that. I remember that when there was the North Korea threat two years ago, it was very interesting because um, People in Guam, when Donald Trump is talking about defending the U.S. against North Korea, is he really talking about defending Guam? Is he really thinking about defending Guam? Or is he talking about defending the United States? Because if, if Guam is the tip of the spear, then it's not really a part of the United States. It's used to defend the United States. And that's what territories are, historically. Um, for any number of empires, any number of countries. And so it was interesting then because something was tweeted out on Fox News which said that people should pray for those stationed on Guam that are under North Korean threat. And people were worried on Guam. What? Did they forget about the rest of us who aren't on the bases? And so this is why you want a higher level of sovereignty. Is because if you're a state, the U.S. is obligated to defend you. It is not necessarily obligated to defend a territory. We may wish it would, we may, maybe we would like it to, definitely, but it's not obligated in the same way to defend the home front. Um, if you were an independent country and had a defense agreement, you would have a higher standing, perhaps, than, than a, a territory, a territory which is on the other side of the world. So that's why, uh, when I said a higher level of sovereignty, I was speaking not just for independence, but even as a state, is that if you want to make sure that the umbrella of American power defends you, then you should probably seek to become incorporated in the United States, because then you would have a stronger argument, as opposed to nowadays where whether Guam is part of the United States depends on if somebody remembers that it is. Uh, thank you for the great uh, information you're giving us, Dr. Paris. Uh, I'm a lay person. I uh, work at school. I'm a teacher. I teach this in my class because I teach social studies. What I'm really curious about and that really stuck out to me was that you talked about the future and how security is something that we can't uh, give up. We can't uh, predict the future in terms of the geopolitical status and also the value of Guam to the United States. I understand that. And so what I'm trying to get at is that it seems now that with the impending buildup that Guam's value to the U.S. is very high. You also mentioned that maturity-wise, as a political government here, I guess, our politics is quite young. And so I'm trying to look for a way forward. What is it going to take for us to not only come together as an island, but also mature politically enough so that we can finally make that choice because I feel that status quo puts us at a great disadvantage. That's the question I, I've been trying to find for myself. I can't choose between the free political status at this time for myself, but I do know that what we're at right now, it doesn't leave us in the best position. I used to be in the military myself. So I know what it's like to be a soldier and follow orders. I understand what it is to have security as a possible compromise. We don't want to lose that. But at the same time, I do see that the value of the island and the people here really have no say in what takes place because of our current relationship with the federal government. And I like what you said earlier, how 
you were stating a history how Guam and the federal government, the people here had to either work around it, undermine it, or do what they could with what they had. And that is the situation that we had to go through. But what I want to know now is, what's the way forward for us? What is it going to take for us to mature politically? And how can we get to a point as a group, as an island, to make that decision to move forward? Well, there's a lot to unwrap in that, but I'll just summarize it in a couple of ways. <clears throat> the first is, how do we get the body, the body politic to be mature? I don't know. I mean, that's an individual and collective uh, effort on the part of our political leadership. Only they can answer that, okay? As far as the disadvantages that we have had in the past, I would tell you, we didn't really try to undermine anything. What we tried to do was work within that framework and um, got a lot of things done from uh, electing our governor to uh, non-voting delegate to a lot of different things with the federal government been able to do. And we've been able to do that because we have a direct uh, tie with that. I understand the issue of a higher level of sovereignty, uh, but that was what I was alluding to earlier about um, the option of what we have today and really getting our, you know what, together uh, so that we know exactly what it is that we want to seek a higher level of um, union with the U.S., maybe not necessarily a state, but it could be a state. I mean, who's to say 100 years from now that the model followed centuries ago when the 50 states became states, that may not be the same model because conditions might have changed. And Guam might be just as close to the U.S., even though we're 5,000 miles away. So, um, but in the meantime, um, absent the higher level of sovereignty that uh, Mr. Bukwafa, Dr. Bukwafa had, uh, mentioned earlier, there are things that we can do to improve our lot. You know, uh, it's not necessarily all or nothing at this point. We have a lot that we can do to improve our lot. Uh, and I think that's where, as a community, uh, we're shortchanging ourselves because we're better than what we have right now. I don't know if I answered your question, but. Okay. Please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Paris. Okay. Thank you. I, I want to give you this letter on behalf of our Dean of Libraries, Monique Story, and the staff and management at Mark. Thank you very much for being our last speaker. Thank you. For 2019.